this week on Core Talk. Hearing this negative feedback of, of what's not working and saying, okay, like, what do we need to fix and how can we do that? I mean, that, that whole problem solving thing is, is what engineering is in a nutshell. You find one problem, you solve it, and then, you know, you go to the next problem. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. We're a team of professionals, biologists, engineers, real estate and administrative specialists, lawyers, and many other specialties all working together to deliver engineering solutions that are vital to securing our nation, energizing our economy, and reducing disaster risks. Safely, on time, and within budget. This is Core Talk, the You Safe Norfolk District podcast. From harbor port deepening and coastal storm risk management to environmental restoration and research and development, we exist to serve our community because we are a part of it. SAIs. 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 Let us try. Hello, everyone. You guys out in your vehicles or at home listening to this podcast, thank you for joining us for another episode of Core Talk. Today, we're excited to have two outstanding guests with us, outstanding engineers who will share their personal journeys and insights into the dynamic world of engineering. Let's start with our introductions. I'm Holly Birkenhoff. Um, I've been with the Norfolk District for about three and a half years. I started here as a civil slash coastal engineer in the hydraulics and hydrology section. Uh, there, I was working on a bunch of different projects, including beach nourishment, oyster, wetland restoration, um, design of coastal structures, and a lot of uh, coastal storm risk management studies throughout the whole eastern seaboard. Hello, my name is Abby Pruddy. Um, I've been with the Army Corps of Engineers for almost six years. Uh, so I studied biological systems engineering at Virginia Tech, which is basically a, a mix between water resources engineering and civil engineering. Um, and then I started here at the Corps as a recent graduate uh, in the planning uh, section and you know, started with some coastal storm risk management studies as well, CSRMs. Um, and have kind of you know stuck with those same studies throughout my years here, and now I am a planning technical lead and project manager for those studies. As you guys are looking at your own careers, and you guys are aware of how you started, what how what idea you had in your mind when you decided I'm going to be an engineer, and you compare that to where you are, and you look reviewing your entire journey, can you guys share that story with us? So. I recognize this might be a little atypical from, from most people heading into college, but uh, when I was in high school, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. Oh, loaded question. But um, I, at the time, I was trying to decide if I wanted to go into like physical therapy or employ the sustainability aspect of the AP environmental science class that I took that I really loved. My dad went through the Texas A&M course catalog and had pulled out a bunch of different options that would use sustainability, and one of those was ocean engineering. And for, right off the bat, like you hear like aerospace, geotech, um, civil, like, and ocean is kind of its own small thing um, that isn't very widely known. And I just looked at it, and it looked kind of cool. And I go, "What is this?" Uh, and he was. He's also an engineer and he was working with some ocean engineers or graduates of the ocean engineering program at Texas A&M. And they were building islands in Galveston Bay um, for cool. placement of dredge material. So going and dredging the, the federal navigation channel and making places for that dredge material to go. And he goes to Google Earth, pulls up these islands and shows them to me and I go, that's really cool. That's what I want to do with my life. Um, and so fast forward, literally like almost to the day, eight years, and I'm at the Norfolk District, and we receive a new project request for um, investigating if there, there's a federal interest in building an island specifically for seabird nesting habitat since the Commonwealth's seabird colony was losing its historic nesting habitat because of the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel Expansion Project. So that was like a really weird, like, wow, I manifested that for myself. Um, That's it awesome. was a really specific manifestation, but it, it, was, it was really cool to feel that come to fruition for me. That's really great. Abby, what about you? Oh, I'm sorry. No, I, I, you know, I, I remember when you first told me that story when we were out at uh, Willoughby and uh, I thought it was really cool to see your life go for full circle from high school to your career mm -hmm. now. 
Um, that doesn't normally happen to everybody. So it's just a cool and exciting story to see, and we're, we're glad to have you over here. Yeah, thank you. Glad to be here. <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of jealous of that. Exactly. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, don't uh, don't put me in front of a, high, a group of high school students because for some reason I knew exactly what I wanted to do, and if I tell them that, then they're just going to feel bad about themselves. Set so. the bar high. <laughs> Abby, what about you? So I feel like as a kid, when you picture like an engineer, I don't know, what I always pictured was somebody who's like doing all these like calculations and drawings and, you know, complicated models and stuff on the computer. And do I do any of that in my day to day? No. <laughs> um, but I work with people who do that. And, you know, I did study some of those things in, in modeling and, and obviously a lot of math in college for my engineering degree. Um, and what I feel like I have learned in my career is that engineering is kind of an umbrella term for a lot of different things. Um, you know, you can go the more technical route and do the modeling, um, which is kind of what Holly does, um, or you can go, you know, the slightly less technical route. Um, you know, it's all it's all problem solving, um, and I think that my engineering background in college um, has been very helpful for you know my less technical work that I do now. You know now I'm a project manager and I oversee a multidisciplinary team that has engineers. So I have you know the context and a little bit of the knowledge of like what they do and, and what goes into it, what they need as far as data and inputs and time and things like that. Um, and that certainly helps me with my like day to day. But you know I, I I didn't know what I wanted to do when I was a kid and. I never thought that I would, you know, if, if you had asked me, a little eight-year-old Abby, like, you know, what are you going to do when you grow up? I would have never, you know, I would have never pictured that I'd be a project manager for the Army Corps of Engineers. I, yeah. I think that's really cool, too. Do you know who Sadhguru is by any chance? I do not. He's one of the uh, very well-known yogi gurus. And there's one thing that he says. He says, I hope that none of your dreams come true. And he says it with this huge smile on his face. And I remember when I was first watching that video, it was him and Matthew McConaughey talking. And I was like, okay, that's, that's horrible. <laughs> and, he, and he goes on to explain that what we can imagine or what we can dream of is only a degradation or an exaggeration of something that we've already experienced or heard somebody else experienced. So he says that when he looks at people, he hopes that beyond their wildest dreams come true, something that they never could have imagined. Yeah, that's kind of cool. And it kind of sounds like that's what yeah. may have happened with you. I think that's awesome. All right, so Holly, I know that you've worked on coastal storm risk management. I know that you've worked with um, environmental restoration. Tell me what those two, working on those two projects has taught you, or what it, how it's helped you, how it's helped shape you as an engineer. So, especially with regards to coastal storm risk management and environmental restoration, those types of projects have really emphasize the importance of being intentional with your communication and making sure that what you're conveying emphasizes that we are held to our specific Army Corps standards and that these are the processes that we have to go through because while other groups might be able to do something one way, we are held to how we have to do it our way. Um, and, and there's a lot of interest in the resiliency and the environmental restoration kind of realm. So there's a lot of different groups that are working on those types of projects. And so there's typically a lot of cross-pollination. So there, there's a lot of, I wouldn't say clarification, but just fact providing mm -hmm. um, and being open to receiving comments from the public. Uh, a lot of these projects are literally in people's backyards where they're living, working, raising their families, and people are gonna be passionate about something that might impact or might be perceived as an impact. And so Definitely. we need we have to be sensitive to all of their their thoughts and feelings. Yeah, concerns, yeah. Definitely. Yeah, and it's it's like especially the stuff you guys are working on right, right now. It's very high vis to the public. A lot of people, um, you know, everyone's got their own concerns, right? And we're trying to support all the needs of the people. Um, you guys are ensuring that the math is correct and all these things to support the designs. Um, and it's not just the people. We're supporting, you know, the higher headquarters that they're trying to manage and ensure that we're in compliance with all of our specs and requirements that we got to do within budget, like all these different aspects, right? So that it's, um, you got a lot of people pulling on your, you know, your, your 
threads as you're trying to make sure that we're given the, the best quality project. But yeah, I think it's very, very important that you guys are, you know, one, doing the math right, and obviously you got the people that are supporting you, um, you know, within the chain. Um, so that's really good. If somebody were to ask me or put the idea of engineering into my mind, communication is one of the last things that I would have thought to mention. Yeah, engineers aren't necessarily uh, extroverted by any means. Uh, a lot of them are introverted, so it's, I'm, I don't know how it works with you guys when it comes to people talking to you about your math problem set and stuff like that, but. Yeah, I mean, having to get up there and explain and, and justify yourself is not always fun, but I personally have tried to train myself where if you can't say the reason why you're doing something in 30 seconds or less and you're just rambling, then you really don't know why you're doing it. So keeping the sound bite short and concise and not using overly technical jargon is definitely the way that I have tried to convey information to in all of the different ways that I have discussions with people, whether it's the public or a sponsor or another technical expert. Like, you have to be able to gauge what what level's appropriate. Yeah, I think that Drew um, Gebler, he brought that up in our last episode. It's, it's a very basic human thing just to think about, you know, the way we communicate. You don't know what's in my head. I know what's in my head. And sometimes I let that shape how I'm going to organize the words in my sentence. And maybe that message doesn't really hit home with you, you know. So when you're an engineer and you have all the all of this technical know-how and expertise, even more so. So Abby, tell us about your experience. Where are you going to let it take you? So I have spent, you know, time in engineering, time in planning, time in project management. Um, I think that having having kind of that back that spread out background has helped me tremendously, just as far as my you know personal growth, my professional growth, my skills. Because um, you know when you're when you specialize in one you know discipline or area, you you tend to get very hyper focused on you know. What are, what are my roles on the team? What do I need to produce? What am I working on? Um, it's, you know, you're not looking at the bigger picture, so to speak. Um, and it's helped me just become a better professional um, to, to be able to also kind of step back and, and look at projects as a whole and not just in, you know, my discipline, just not just from an engineering stance, but also from public affairs or environmental. You know, as a planner, you are kind of the, you're the champion of the report, you know, we call it. Um, and even though as a planner, your main job is plan formulation, so you're you know, com coming up with measures and alternatives and, form and evaluating those, um, you still oversee all of the other aspects that go into the report, and a big part of that is communication, uh, because the report is really telling a story of what we're doing in the study and why we're doing it. That's really important too, is um, you, know, you have to connect it back to I guess what the purpose and the need of the study is. Why do we care? Um, in the term of, I guess, in the realm of coastal storm risk management studies, the why is because it affects real people and their livelihood and their, you know, their homes and their businesses, and you know, it, it affects people. It affects communities in real life, and that's why we do it. Um, it's also, I don't know. It's it's been very helpful for me to develop my skills uh, between communication and technical writing and briefing, you know, to have that uh, experience in both engineering and in planning. That makes a lot of sense. Given what you've just said, you work with various different types of stakeholders. There's, you have different partners for the different projects, but you're also working in different communities. Mm -hmm. What types of challenges or even lessons learned things that also help shape you as an engineer or just as a professional, what what comes about with all of these different facets? Yeah, I, I can talk about this for a while. I have a soapbox. So um, public engagement, I we feel- We have a soapbox. Yes. Um, <laughs> I guess in the in so 30 years ago in the in the pre-social media days, you know, kind of the way that the core went about public engagement was we would have, you know, in-person public meetings and there would be physical comment cards that people would have to show up and you know, if they want to give a comment on a project, they have to come in person and either write the comment or mail it to the district. You know, now with social media, there is just so much more visibility and opportunity for engagement and and people just staying updated with what's going on. Um, and I feel like uh, it's been an interesting challenge, but also um, a really cool like opportunity to 
to change some of these practices as like the planner and the project manager of some studies because um, what I have found as a big lesson learned is that that old system of the, the two or three in-person public meetings across a three-year study, that is not real public engagement. You know, that's giving the select members of the public who happen to see the notice, you know, you have one or two chances to come and, and give your thoughts and that's it. You know, that's not really engaging them. That's not really collecting feedback and utilizing that feedback and actually, you know, changing what you're doing based on it. Um, and so, you know, I've been trying to think of, you know, innovative ways and, and working with my teams on these studies to figure out how we can realistically, because, you know, you do also have to, you have to make decisions. You do have to produce a report and, and keep things moving. You know, you know we, we do have deadlines and things like that, but, um, you know, trying to find ways to be more actually inclusive and have the engagement be real engagement in terms of, you know, letting stakeholders and non-federal partners actually shape what we're doing. So like, for example, we have completely changed up and done like in-person planning workshops and charrettes. Um, I've, I've hosted three of them just in the last 12 months. Um, I've also done uh, probably 10 to 15 public meetings just this year between my two studies and that's combined virtual and in person you know we we've started working on like a story map which is basically like an interactive website where people can go on and give comments virtually or email us directly at any time you know it's it's been interesting trying to adapt and evolve at the same pace as like social media and you know finding ways to to be more inclusive of people in our in our study process yeah and i i just want to kind of add that in addition to all of those public meetings that you're having, within even just like a study area, you can have localized groups that have certain opinions. So within the same project, you could be trying to appease five, 10, 20 different ideologies. And so we're, we're constantly trying to thread the needle of making people happy, but also realizing you're not gonna make everybody happy. Okay, I, I get that. But how do, so how do you measure success? Okay, well, so because you, you met, you said that you realized that there is, there was something just wasn't enough. So you're trying to develop new ways to, to ensure that the, that the community, that every, anybody that can be affected has a way of, you know, making their voice heard. Yeah. But has there been, and I could, I understand if it's still, you know, a work in pro, uh, progress. I mean, that those things, yeah. a lot of things are, and anything that's really good and effective should always be continually evolving. Right. But is, have we been able to see like where have have people come up to you and like let you know like what what is the feedback been? Yeah, so I know the army likes their acronyms. A big thing that the army does is called AARs after action reviews. Um, basically, what that means is you know you do something and then you go back and say, okay, what do you guys think of that? How did it go? What could we have done better? You know, what should we do next? Um, and so with some of these new kind of unique practices as far as public engagement that I've been doing on some studies, um, I actually hosted a, a mini AAR um, with some of those stakeholders and I asked them, um, you know, like what, what could we have done better? What did you like? What did you not like? Uh, what can we do in the future? Um, and have gotten some really cool feedback from people. Um, things like, you know, the, this, the way that this planning charrette went, a charrette is like a workshop, um, is night and day difference from what I saw from the core four years ago on this study. Or, you know, like uh, people saying that they previously did not have any trust for the government or for USACE, and, you know, they feel like they're being heard. They feel like we care about their opinions and their feedback. They feel like they're actually being involved and like, you know, their thoughts are being taken seriously. Like I, I have gotten, you know, really cool and rewarding feedback like that. Um, I've also just, you know, I, I sometimes join, you know, council, local council meetings or, you know, summits or conventions and things. And, and especially in the South Florida area, there's you, you tend to see the same people representing certain agencies. And, and I've it's really cool to sometimes hear them call out, you know, USACE and, and these studies that I work on as like an example of, of how we're like innovating, you know, the, the public engagement process. Like that's been very rewarding. Ali, what have you seen in your experience? One of the things that we've been trying at Norfolk District to, to really kind of innovate on was like the design charrettes and producing like 
the architectural renderings to, to show the intent of what we are proposing with a feasibility study and then even moving forward into the next phases. Historically, I think our feasibility studies have just shown like a line on a map with a verbal description, uh, which to the general public that don't have an engineering background or a background in, in resiliency and understand flood walls and, and how structural measures work and are designed and what they look like. Um, you just say, oh, I'm gonna have this 16 foot high um, top of wall elevation and they think, oh, above the ground, it's gonna be 16 feet. Well, no, that that's not necessarily the case. The actual height of the wall above the ground depends on the uh, variability of the actual ground surface itself. So that that kind of rendering can show, hey, here's a person next to this wall. This is what it's realistically going to look like. This is how it, our proposed project would impact your life. Um, and that that's something that we are, are building. Um, and it's we're building that program and trying to be better about being proactive with explaining projects that way. Um, it is also a function of time and money. So the, we've been finding that the scopes of these studies just keep increasing and the requirements of the holistic engineering team just keep increasing. And there's not always an appetite for additional time and money um, to get these studies done correctly in the ways that they were done back in the 80s, 90s, when you would have 10 plus years to fully flesh out every aspect of one of these big type of flood risk reduction study. Yeah, I, I, that's a, it's a, I know it's a huge topic right now at the deputies course, General Graham talked about that a lot with all the commanders as well. Um, design maturity, lessons learned from all the three by three models that are not necessarily, you know, supportive to what we want to accomplish in those time frames, right? Um, so we're taking all those lessons learned. Um, and then going back to what Abby was saying, like, we're, we're, we're keeping the relationships with the public and the people and we're letting them know like, hey, like, we're going to need more time, it's going to take more money, like these things happen, but we're going to give you the best product because we have the best engineers here. And that's what we want to do is continue to build those quality products. So when it comes to like your points about communication and how to how to do that effectively with members of the public about technical things, I have a joke with my teams. I, I like to say, think of grandma because, uh, you know, like like imagine, for example, the story map. It's basically like um, an interactive way to explain the study and also just the USACE feasibility process, uh, which, you know, to the average American taxpayer, they don't, they have no idea what we do or what that process is. Um, and <laughs> yeah. Um, and what I have told my team and like the joke is that, you know, we need to explain these things so that grandma can understand, you know, like, like imagine you're trying to, to explain your study and what you do to, you know, just some random, you know, American taxpayer, you know, like if I was trying to explain it to my grandma, I would have to say it a certain way using layman's terms, you know. Um, and so that's what I tell my team whenever we like make anything for the public, you know, think of grandma. How does how does how do we need to phrase it and, and describe it so that people with no technical background whatsoever can have a clue of what's going on? <laughs> and, the, and the thing, and at least what I'm hearing, saying it like you're saying it to grandma, it's, it's not like you're saying it like you care you're saying it that way to grandma because you care exactly yeah i think that what both of you explained is it's very cool and please stop me if i'm wrong but it sounds like the partners the stakeholders and the communities themselves have kind of helped shape you as professionals you know through all of the you know the engagements and reactions and interactions do you see that as the case? Would you say that the communities and the projects and the stakeholders are kind of like the stone that sharpens the knife in a way? For me, for sure, because I know for so for Collier Coastal Summer Management Feasibility Study, I, I usually just call it Collier CSRM. Um, you know, we had a, an initial three years and then it went on pause while we were awaiting approval for more time and money. Um, and in the first three years, you know, I came on to that study kind of towards the end and I heard just overwhelming negative from the public, from stakeholders, about them feeling like they weren't involved and you know they weren't listened to, and just a whole bunch of concerns. And I, I've, as somebody who you know, 
I take pride in my work and what I do here and in my studies. And I came onto the team hearing all this and one felt a little bit, you know, deflated, like, you know, this sucks, we need to improve this, but also like almost like a mission to like, you know, turn that around a little bit. And that has absolutely been like the driving factor that has shaped like all of our, I guess, innovations and changes to our public engagement process in general is, is hearing this negative feedback of, of what's not working and saying, okay, like, what do we what do we need to fix and how can we do that? I mean, that, that whole problem solving thing is, is what engineering is in a nutshell. It's you find one problem, you solve it, and then, you know, you go to the next problem. And I, I, I do appreciate your pride on those projects because that's not in our backyard, right? You're, yeah. you're talking about Florida. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, nor, that's not close to us, right? Right. But, uh, you know, it's a little more intimate for us with CS or with Virginia Beach and Norfolk because we all live in these areas. Right. So we do appreciate the pride and the passion that you're putting into these things because we know it's very important to the people there. Yeah. I've been shaped by the conversations with the public and with the non-federal sponsor um, with varying levels of frequencies of meetings by having questions being asked of me and having to answer them and I can personally tell, based off of how confident I feel about my response, how well I know our processes and how well I know what we've been doing and where we're going from here. So I like to go into these meetings educated and being able to explain things um, concisely but factually. And I've also had the experience on the consulting side of the industry where some of my clients were the non-federal sponsors and in understanding their frustration with the black box. So I, I can communicate and try to like cross that bridge um, and make the connections of this is, I, I get what you're feeling. I get why you're frustrated. This is why we're having to do what we're doing. And we're not telling you just like get on board with it, but. But it's being transparent, right? Yes. And that's what we're doing every yeah. day. Trying our best to. <laughs> But yeah, that, like that, that's been, I think over the past year, year and a half, that's been my biggest personal growth that I've, I've noticed in myself. And it makes you evolve as a person, right? Because like mm -hmm. you can sit in your cubicle all day and just building specs and drawing whatever, but um, once you put it out there to the public and you start getting that feedback, it starts making you rethink how you're designing these things for future projects, right? And that's what the... I think that's the importance of these meetings and having these interactions because it, it develops you, it, it helps give you a different perspective on things. And I think that's kind of what you're, you're pulling at on, the, on this, uh, this thread a little bit of, of how they're helping shape us in our decision-making process and how we're doing business here, which is perfect. Yeah, and I did recently change positions uh, within engineering, so I'm no longer in hydraulics and hydrology. I'm now in design management. So completely different uh, where I'll be the bridge between like military facilities that are our customers um, and the the architectural engineering firms that receive work that we've contracted out. So I'm just that liaison between customers and the people that are doing the work. So trying to make sure that the customer's needs are being met, that their needs are being conveyed in the correct manner to the people that are doing the work. The people that are doing the work are doing it in compliance with the proper policies uh, and, and just kind of taking the same tools and things that I've learned and developed in myself over the past three and a half years and applying it in a completely different manner to a completely, completely different type of project. Yeah, that next person's got big shoes to fill in that position that you left. <laughs> yeah, that, make, that makes sense. And I hope it made sense when I asked that question. The reason why I phrase it that way is because it seems to me that, you know, from the moment that we're born, as we're trying to identify with who we are, it's kind of a deductive reasoning process. I touch this table. I feel that I'm touching it, but I don't feel I, that I'm the, the recipient of the touch. That table is not me. Oh, this is and, deep. Yeah, so like I, I, I realize who <laughs> I am and where I am by what I'm interacting with and who I'm interacting with in my environment. So it kind of just led me down that down that that rabbit hole that maybe you guys identify with your own ability to problem solve based on the stakeholders and the partnerships and the communities that you guys are working with every day. I mean, that's part of setting the scope for a project. You need to understand why people care about what you're doing. How would either of you qualify the impact that you say as projects, that, the way that you've seen them impact the communities? And 
to what degree after all of that are you professionally fulfilled? Yeah, I think a really cool example of the impact of one of our projects and how it can have an impact on the community is our Lynn Haven phase one wetland restoration project, which was at Princess Anne High School. Mm-hmm. It was about seven acres of wetlands um, literally on the school property. So it's now like a living learning facility. And I got to go out like right as construction was starting. I got to see it through like the pre uh, construction phase where it was just a wall of Phragmites, which is an invasive species, um, which we were trying to eradicate and and re- return back to a native vegetation and go out, see how the contractors progressing uh, with the construction. And then when they were uh, planting the native species back, we had a, a student planting day. So the, the Army Corps professionals from all of the different disciplines that work in wetland restoration got to go out and, and try to teach students. Uh, it was both high school and I think there was one group of elementary students that came through that day. And we got to teach them the functionality of a wetland, like how the critters that are benefited from wetlands have a, a snowball kind of impact and improvement on on the the whole Lynn Haven ecosystem, which rolls <laughs> into the Chesapeake Bay. Right. Um, like it, it's a small ripple that can have larger impacts. But but that was really cool to be able to tying back to earlier, like how uh, my sustainability and like environmental science class in high school made me want to be an engineer. I had hoped that through that day there could be someone that might have been in a science class that got to go out and learn about wetlands and be inspired to want to pursue the same kind of path. Right, you plant that seed. Yeah, there was actually one or two students that were really interested in it. I I like, that was like, okay, this is really cool. Like, passing the baton to the next generation. And shout out to your environmental science teacher for uh, getting you on this bandwagon, it's awesome. I know it's a little bit different though for you, Abby, right? So your, your stuff's not necessarily. Yeah, so I guess in in my line of work and what I do, I feel like the ultimate fulfillment is passing on a completed study report to Congress, you know, and, and the studies that I work on, um, they haven't gotten to that point yet. They're still ongoing. So um, I, haven't gotten, I haven't gotten to see these projects be actually funded and designed and built, you know, that'll be, that would be the most fulfilling and impactful thing I feel like. Um, but, uh, you know, the reality is that like you say, we can't address every water resources challenge. And I think one really impactful, um, thing that I've seen when I, when doing these studies and, and working with communities is that, uh, the conversations that we have with them about the study and what we can do and what we can't do in this study, um, it, is impactful, I think, because it's prompting you know conversations and coming together and, and trying to assess as a community and with these stakeholders like what the challenges are and how they can you know think about potentially resolving them or, or partnering with us or other federal agencies to address them. You know, I think that even though I haven't seen any like physical projects get built yet that I've worked on, um, I have seen a lot of really cool just communities coming together and talking about very serious challenges and water resources issues and try to problem solve and, and, you know, find ways to resolve that. So with the complexity of these projects and their very long duration, at least least it seems that way to me coming from a completely different environment, how do you manage to balance everything? How does it affect your, you know, that work life balance? I mean, overall, I I do feel like I still have a very good work life balance. Um, You know, it's, I think when you get really passionate about your job and you just care about what you do, sometimes your work-life balance can tend to suffer a little bit. Um, and that's kind of just a part of life, I think. But overall, you know, I, at the end of the day, like my, I have a family, my teammates have families. So it's, it's you, have to, you do have to find, I know balance, I guess, is the buzzword in this question, but you have to find a balance between like, what can we reasonably and, and actually accomplish versus you know what's asking too much of my team because we want to serve these communities we want to do good but we also you know we have to prioritize ourselves and our families and our lives too so i mean me personally um i've worked on large-scale civil works projects in the area where i live and 
I'll just drive around and it I see projects that I work on or I know friends work on and I just I wonder how they're doing. Um, like I'll be walking the beach at Virginia Beach Oceanfront, which is one of our hurricane protection projects. And I'm just casually strolling along and I'm like making mental notes about beach performance. But it's not really something where it's like, I'm so stressed out that I have to be like in the weeds at 2 a.m. But the nature of who I am, and I'm, I'm an observant engineer that wants to always be aware of what's going on because that situational awareness helps you ask the right questions at the right time. But I I mean, here at Norfolk District, I have found that if you wanna take vacation, Mm -hmm. you go take vacation. If something comes up when you're away, the team figures out how to adapt and overcome, and then they just bring you up to speed whenever you come back. Like it's very nice to have, to recognize if you're going on vacation and you say, even if I say like, I will have my cell phone. Like you can text me if there are major issues and you need something from me. Nobody ever does. Right. When you consider your personal values, what motivates you to work effectively in an organization? When you consider USA's Norfolk District's mission, if you were living somewhere else other than Virginia, what would make you move here to participate in the mission set that we have here? What would attract you? What would what would make you, what about what you do every day would make you think, I have to go get that? It goes back to kind of what I was saying earlier, which is what we do is important. Like it it matters. It matters to the communities that we work in. Um, it it has a real impact. It, it affects, you know, real people. And it's it's kind of crazy. You know, sometimes I, I think about what I do from like an outsider perspective and it's like, whoa, like, I am leading teams doing a project and influencing this project, and then that is gonna go to Congress, and then that's gonna be written into law, and then it's gonna be built. Like, whoa. <laughs> and, you know, I just, I feel like having fulfillment and, and feeling like I'm doing something that is important and meaningful, you know, that's, that's what would pull me here. For me personally, just getting to work on so many different types of projects in the engineering space at Norfolk District is a really big appeal. We keep a lot of the design work at Norfolk District in-house. We don't just automatically contract everything out to consulting firms. So if you wanna work on design, then you can actually work on design at Norfolk District. But if you also want to be more on the management side. They also need the technical managers in design management, which I just moved over to. Uh, like you can figure out what you want to do and navigate within uh, the organizational structure until you find the home where you're one going to be the best fit and two going to be personally the happiest. Yeah, no, that's great. I know, just like you said, like. Once you've been to one district, you know one district, right? Because there's 43 different business models uh, across the nine divisions. Um, and everything is unique. Like we're unique. Every district has its own problem set. Like whether it's Milcon, Civil Works, and uh, Emergency Management. Some people just have Civil Works. Some people just have mil- Military Construction. So if you want to bounce around in the district, right, you have that opportunity because we have s- such a wide breadth of opportunity in the district. If you advocate for yourself, chances are you will be supported to follow that path. And and I feel like that is very unique in in today's day and age that there will be such an emphasis on training people. Yeah, I agree with that. Because when I started at the core, I had literally graduated from college two weeks beforehand. I was a brand new, no experience, novice GS7 planner coming into the federal government for the very first time, had no idea what anything was <laughs> or you know all of the guidance and the policies, you know the hierarchy of the organization. And um, I do think that the training and the mentorship um, and just the, the people that I've gotten to learn from while I'm here has been huge for my personal development. Um, I think you know you have to you have to be given a chance when you're new um and i i got those chances and you know one one thing that i try to do is is give new employees or or you know shadowing novice employees the same chances um you know like i went to a charrette in public meetings and i took a a couple new employees with me because you know when i started i got that chance i was given the opportunity to go on 
you know, a, a random project, public meeting, road show or something. And, and I got to learn a lot from that. And, you know, I, I want to give others those chances to, you know, pay it forward. So, yeah, that sounds very significant. And one thing that you mentioned earlier, you know, helping shape policy, you know, in Congress, that's a, that's a huge deal. Mm-hmm. How long did it take you to become comfortable sitting in your chair? Well, there are moments where I'm still not, (laughs) Um, but I think a big part of that is I also did the planning associates program, which if you're, if you're not familiar, it's a two year program that is led through headquarters and they select planners from different districts across the nation. And you get very specific and I guess more tailored trainings on the different authorities that we do. So like coastal storm risk management, um, environmental restoration, stuff like that. But you also get trainings on just how the hierarchy of the organization works when it comes to making policy, changing policy, how we as an agency interact, you know, with the levels above us at Capitol Hill. So with um, the ASA office, uh, with OMB, with Congress, you know, that whole process of how, you know, projects are funded, how legislation comes to be, you know, things like that. And that has been really cool because I am kind of, you know, in the trenches, so to speak. I'm on, you know, study teams actually doing the projects. And it's been really cool and helpful for me just to learn those processes and stuff because I was able to go to Capitol Hill and see from the, you know, their perspective, from the policy makers perspective, and and also give them my perspective of, you know, the the doer, the the in the trenches teammate. Sir, so, so and, and this, I'm gonna to try to bring this to a close talking about the culture here. There's a big emphasis on people, and I've seen that in the last two and a half years that I've been here, not only with the members of our community, not with only with our partners and our stakeholders, but the people within this organization. Development, as Abby was just saying, is a very big deal. What are, you, what are your thoughts on the importance of people and, and the significance of development of our engineers, of all of our professionals over a period of time. Yeah, and in the Army, we, we say people first. That's the top priority um, because at the end of the day, like if you don't have the, the smart people that are capable of doing the, the job, then you're not going to be successful. As leaders and supervisors in the organization, our job is to mentor and teach and train our subordinates so they can eventually take your job, right? Because at some point, you're going to leave. We have a lot of turnover happening this winter, right? We have a lot of folks that have been here for 40 years. They're tired and they want to go home and relax and, and rest. Now it's our job. We got two rising stars here um, in the organization that are coming up, and now they're the future of the Norfolk District, right? So they're they're the ones that are kind of learning from our our our, uh, our folks that have been in the organization for a long time, have a lot of history, and now they're going to step up and and provide that support. But we have lots of opportunities to train and mentor. We're doing our supervisor development courses. Um, we got a program that uh, the executive staff has agreed on, um, and now we're going to pay for it because we know how important it is to support the development of our supervisors as well as the, the, our uh, employees of the organization. So 100% people, um, if, if we're not taking care of them and teaching them how to be um, successful in the organization, then, then what are we doing? I think that was one of the first things that impressed me here, one of the first town halls I went to, seeing how many people are here 20, 30, 40 years, and I'm asking myself, there has to be something about working here that makes it worthwhile. Yeah, hundred percent. And I think that's it's the culture that we've established here, right? And then it's the leadership that comes through, right? So for us, like the green suitors, we're, we're here for three years and then we're out, right? We know that we all come and go from our perspective, but it's the civilians here uh, and the employees that make the place enjoyable, right? Like we talked about this in the last podcast. And for me, this has been an awesome experience working with all these employees that are all super SMEs, like way smarter than me. I studied engineering management, but they're driving this train 100% uh, and leading us to all the great things that we're doing in the district. Well, thank you, Holly and Abby, for sharing your experiences and your insights. And to our listeners, thank you for joining us. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more engaging conversations. We're done for today. Remember, we value your feedback, so feel free to comment and suggest topics for future episodes, please. And until next time on Core Talk. Thanks, guys. Thank you, James. Thank you. Thanks.